Welcome to the Rebecca Panapinto Project. Today, I'm very excited to interview Pontus Noren. Pontus is an accomplished serial entrepreneur, technology visionary, and the founder of CloudReach. Today, Pontus serves as the founder and CEO of Savvy. He has over 25 years of international experience within the IT industry, working as the CEO, as well as in sales, business development, and product management. Pontus has even worked for blue chip companies like Cisco and Nokia. Outside of his day-to-day work, Pontus also serves on the boards of Tyke and Geospock, and he's an advisor to the Privacy Compliance Hub. As you can see, Pontus is a very busy entrepreneur who's making a big impact in the IT industry. He also holds tight to his beliefs in mentorship and his principles. Enjoy the show. Pontus, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Rebecca. So excited to have you. This is going to be a great conversation today and love the background there as well. Thank you very much. Yes, slightly arty, I would say. Yeah, I didn't know you were so artistic. So I really appreciate that as uh, the nice visual background there. Yeah, no worries at all. So I'm so excited to dive in today. You have such an impressive background. Your time at CloudReach and what you learned there is super impressive. You've been a mentor to some people that I see as mentors myself, and I'm just an absolutely huge fan of. Um, so really excited to dive into your story, what you're up to now, and really your your vision for digital transformation and what that means in the world. So let's dive in first to a little bit about what you learned during CloudReach. So CloudReach was multi-cloud provider. You had an awesome exit there. Really, what did you learn about digital transformation during your time with CloudReach? And maybe tell us how that's transitioned to what you're working on today. Wow. Yeah, that's a... That's a big topic. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> um, you know what was interesting? You know, starting a company in the beginning of 2009 to essentially help enterprises adopt and transition to take advantage of cloud, true cloud platforms such as Google Apps, so Google Workspace today, Amazon Web Services, uh, etc., was very interesting when most people barely understood what these platforms were there to do, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So explaining that to people and what benefits they might get, finding people who are like-minded, you know, it was a significant challenge in the beginning because, yeah, I mean, there were things that today people just take for granted around security and privacy and everything these platforms deliver. There were huge question marks around that, you know, 13 years ago. so the initial journey around kind of digital transformation was a lot more around kind of selling the hard benefits of not owning a data center of, you know, virtually unlimited inbox storage in Google apps, you know, they, through Gmail. I don't know if people even remember this nowadays, but, you know, most companies 15 years ago had a hard limit on how much email you can store in your inbox, like 250 meg. Someone sent you like two presentations. That was game over. You had to clean up your <laughs> inbox. That's a long time ago, right? Today, we just assume these things are unlimited. That was not you know, the way the world worked. So hmm. the benefits of digital transformation, I have people thought of digital transformation in 2009. It's just wildly different to what it is today, right? Where back then, IT was the property of the IT department. Yeah. You know, today, in most modern enterprises, IAT is just integral into everything you do. The applications that you use, whether you are in finance or in sales or in the manufacturing team, wherever you're working, you will have a say in and be part of the selection process and understanding of IT and applications and devices and all this stuff. I mean, the, the general population is just so much more IT literate today than it was 12, 13 years ago. I mean, you had to go to the IT team to get support. So, you know, the changes that we saw and the attitudes around it and, and the, the role that applications and IT in general plays in the enterprise changed just so much over that 10, 15 year period, probably more than ever in, in the history of IT. Um, so to start a business, to build a business, to grow a business, to run a business, hire people, get people trained, getting customer onboarded, um, renew these customers, you know, helping them out and what they want to achieve was, you know, a massive privilege. So there was just so many learning points. I'm not, I'm not even sure where to start, but it, it's mm-hmm. been a crazy, 
a crazy time, the, the, the tense, whatever you want to call it, uh, yeah. and the period with Cloudreach. Well, and I think especially you hit on how business has learned IT, but I think on the other hand, IT professionals have had to learn business as part of that too. And that was part of the business model at CloudReach is especially with your frontline salespeople, they were business people and solving business problems with digital, with cloud. And that was the way you were able to help the, you know, have the scale that you had and make the impact that you could was by solving true business problems, not just IT problems. Well, exactly, because I mean, what, what the cloud providers did was remove the IT in IT. Yeah. As in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to have armies of people just running around, unpacking boxes and putting things in racks and wiring them up. And that was IT, right? Yeah. It was mm-hmm. very rudimental, fundamental, low level, low value tasks that you had to do, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, as I said to people, if you look at any retailer or manufacturer or pharmaceutical or oil and gas company, whatever, pick any company in the industry. None of these companies at any point did they think, you know what? In order to be successful in our field, we need a data center. That's exactly (laughs) what we want, right? That never happened. But it was just no alternative to building your own data center until, you know, not too, too long ago. And what happened Kind of the first transformation was once the CIO, CTOs, and the leaders of the business decided building and running data center is not a good use of our time, and you abstract away all that complexity, it forced the IT teams to lift themselves up to the next tier and, and kind of look around them and go, okay, so why are we here? Oh, okay, so we need to you know, automate our supply chains, or we need to integrate into you know, payroll systems in a different way, whatever that might be to to take out friction points in the business or in the case of e-commerce and media and those businesses, which is obvious that the revenue is no longer in printing newspapers. It's how you, you know, serve digital content in a multi-channel way, et cetera. So the IT teams were kind of dragged into the front line Mm -hmm. and as the world kind of digitized over the last 10 years, they were allowed and enabled to actually participate in, in the business. And, and I have some remarkable examples of this as well, where um, back in 2010, it was the second half of 2010, was one of the early kind of larger Google Apps migrations we were doing for a, a um, uh, architect firm based here out of London. But they, you know, for an architect firm to have seven, eight hundred people, that's a big firm in that mm-hmm. industry. And they had a big office here with a couple hundred people. They had offices in Dubai, in Hong Kong, in Sao Paulo, in the US, in places, etc. So they were very distributed as well. And they were running like a single server exchange environment in their office in London. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think they did some backups and stuff, but you can imagine the latency when you connect your Outlook app on a laptop in Sao Paulo to read your emails on the server in London. So the user experience was terrible. They had 200 megs, you know, all that stuff. But the guy who ran the IT, he had a lot of foresight, came to us and said, look, we need to move off this stuff. That this is outdated. So we had already, we had only been in business for a year, year and a half, but we, we had developed this pretty well thought through, which we refined over time, change program. Hmm. So we said, guys, this is not an IT problem. Moving your emails and calendar entries and whatever from Exchange to Google, we'll take care of that. What we need to do here is work with the users and get the users up and running. And we had everything from when the project started, we had pre-written an email, giving it to the CEO, where the managing partner of the firm, and it was a he in this case, I think, and he sent the email to all staff outlining why we're moving to Google, what are we trying to get out of it, what could some of the challenges be? How do you get help? And so on. And that was kind of the starting shot to say, this is transformation starts here. Then the IT team got involved in helping out with trainings and you know, all of these things. On the day of the migrations, we had floor walkers. We had done oh. super funky posters everywhere. Google contributed with some cupcakes that we had on the day, yes. et cetera. And literally all of the IT team, there, wasn't that, there weren't that many of them, I don't know, five or 10 people were all on the floor walking around and all that. And there was like a, a, a the, there was an atmosphere of celebration 
because you just liberated them from this problem that was exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And afterwards they said, wow, we have never spent so much time with our users. So we kind of helped them transform the mindset. They're like, and we need to go out and speak to people, understanding their day to day, right? And we ran surgeries as a follow on on the Friday. And here are the shortcut commands in Gmail. And we did all of these things, right? Mm. Um, and, and this was not the only time, by the way. But almost every time we did a big migration for Financial Times group, uh, also based all over the world. They had a, a Lotus Notes environment. And I remember them saying to us afterwards that this one project transformed how they did IT at the time. They literally changed IT the role of IT, how IT works with the rest of the business. But also because they, they, they get out of their, I should, we're about to say hole, but they get out of their kind of mm, rooms and won't yeah. walk in the floor. Um, the user's got a different view as well, right? Because it used to be this, oh no, I have to call IT for support. Oh my God. But actually now it's like, no, we're working together. We're trying to fix mm. this. So I think some of these projects that we did early on really kind of set businesses off on a new path in terms of how, the kind of relationship between the business and IT. And I think that in some cases made them kind of fit better together across everything they did beyond what we did, it got involved in, but our kind of thing pushed them in that direction. That's awesome. Very cool. How did this lead to solving for what you focus on as savvy now with, with the transaction piece of it all too? Was there a time throughout your CloudReach experience or maybe some business you were doing after CloudReach where you were like, okay, now I see this new problem and it's how people transact business B2B. I want to solve that leading to starting Savvy. Well, it, it's interesting, right? So, so Savvy as a company first started out uh, around a different piece of software, which we were given oh, basically the IP from an, a marketing agency that developed it. And we had, you know, 40, 50 K, uh, euros or whatever revenue or pounds per month so you know it was you know a lot of software companies don't get that far basically yeah wow um but what they've done is they package the software inside a marketing program and the marketing teams in their customers and they were big customers like oracle and salesforce and others kind of just bought it as a package then they gave it to the sales people to use it was a social selling app basically and, and we took it over to kind of scale it and take it to another level. But we put some telemetry software in and sort of kind of figuring out how is this really being used? And it turns out in the end that between 5 and 10% of users use the software, which is not anywhere near enough, basically, for this to be successful. So we went back and spoke to a whole bunch of people around it and analyzed this. And we realized that this is a super well-defined and built app. There was no problem necessarily with issues and bugs and it, it was simply just that salespeople didn't see it as part of their day job to post stuff on social media to generate leads and raise the profile of the company they work for etc in other words it wasn't their job to be done for the sales teams right and we got off and hired a bunch of people started this company etc on the back of building this software app right um, and the company who gave us the software had a big stake in this new business. So we're sitting there kind of scratching our heads going, oh my God, what are we going to do? I mean, this is not going to work. It doesn't matter what we do. Like, we, we cannot turn this around. So over time, these things are going to, these customers are going to churn. Mm -hmm. So we had to kind of delicately, delicately tell them, we're probably going to have to shut this down at some point, but we have the money from the revenue and some other money you've given us. We built a small but very good team around this. So we're going to go off and think about other problems that might be that we can solve. Hmm. And it was through those, those discussions that kind of the idea of Savvy was born. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. And now you're digitizing transactions. How does that work today? Well, it doesn't work today, right? This is the, this <laughs> is the I love it. <laughs> you're a realistic uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> No, but if you, if you think about it, right? So when we were sitting down thinking, okay, so salespeople don't think um, social media and posting and stuff is kind of part of their day jobs. Majority of salespeople don't think that. Fair enough. Yeah. What is the job that salespeople do? Well, salespeople sell, fine. Mm -hmm. What are the friction points in that process? And we've looked at so many different things, yeah? And eventually we kind of peeled it all the way back to something pretty damn basic, mm -hmm. which is 
as the salesperson, I'm going to simplify this, but you basically, you go to a meeting with a new lead, you gave them, you gave them a presentation, you talk about a few case studies, you're trying to see if there's a match between what they need and what you have, and the customer at the end of the meeting says, well, why don't you send us that information and we'll take a look and we have a think about it. And you go, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. So I go back to my Gmail or 365, whatever I'm using, and I hack up a nice email and I hit send, and that email will end up as one of you know 2,000 emails for the customer and so on. And yeah. once that's gone out, you're sitting there going, now what, right? Mm -hmm. You got no idea. You don't even know with certainty that an email got through, right? Yeah. Did they actually? Well, receive? especially where you stand in the sale too. Yeah, I mean, did a spam filter pick it up? I mean, you just you don't know. You're totally mm -hmm. in the dark, yeah. Did they open the email? Did they read the email? Did they read the attachments, right? Did they forward the email to other people? Did they open the email? Did they read the attachments? So we start looking at it thinking, this is crazy because then a few days later and the following Monday, your forecast meeting and you've been in a few of those, right? It goes, how's it going? Now you go, well, I think it's the meeting, the meeting went really well and we're sending them information. They seem really keen. So I'm sure this is going to be great. We're going to do a million dollars here, right? That's kind of how you think as a salesperson. But reality is <laughs> you have no clue because you don't know how they reacted. And the only thing to find out is to chase them, chase them, chase them, email them, text them, drive to their house, you know, you kind of go through their Donuts, garbage. Donuts, <laughs> yeah. lunch, yeah. <laughs> Anything, right? How, how does it go? And what is interesting is then we thought initially, okay, let's enable salesperson to put this on a board. And when the customer log on, we will track them. Okay, and we'll track that they log in, we track what they read, et cetera. And the salespeople can see if they're interacting with the content, right? We thought that's 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 genius. There's one flaw. What if the people don't log in, right? So we call a bunch of CAOs and CTOs that we used to work with at CloudReach, so super senior people, big big UK businesses, global FTSE 100 businesses, uh, pretty much all of them. And we explained the idea, and we said, if you are on the receiving end of one of those things, right? Theoretically, this is last summer. We had, we hadn't written a single line of a code. We just said, what if you receive this and you log in? You're going to know we're tracking you. We'll tell you we're tracking you. How do you feel about that? And they're like, well, I get tracked all the time. Because I go to events, they track me there, they track my website. Tracking is not a problem at all. Um, they said, so tell me again what this platform is about. What, what do you mean? Well, it's total chaos on the buying side. It's like, well, tell me more. Well, they said, you know, Ponza, no, you thought we were trying to deliberately annoy you by taking our time. The truth is we might have 30, 40, 50 buying process going in parallel. We have no system for managing these things. It doesn't exist. And there are spreadsheets and inboxes and Google Drive and what have you. Mm. But the reality is it's just chaotic. So if your platform can help us organize how we buy, you're in. I'm like, oh, hang on a second. I said, well, what about a rebuy and procurement tools? They're like, no, that's for managing budgets. We are the buyers. We are the users' buyers. Yeah, procurement have a role to play, but they don't. They just want to control. I want to interact with the supplier, and that's when the penny dropped. We're like, hang on a second. This is not a sales tool. It's a transaction tool, and that's where we landed on the accelerate B two B transactions. It must be our mission because the other thing the CIO said to us was, by the way, I have a budget. I have an objective. It is in my interest to buy from you as quickly as I can because I need to deploy the money. Equally, if, if, I, if I don't think you're the right supplier, I want to get to that conclusion really quickly too to save your time and mine. So th this works both ways. Accelerating stuff is important. And we're like, oh my God, this is so obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Savvy is a platform where you exchange information, you view information, you track stuff, it's a secure environment where the buying team and the supplying team can interact and share. Now, the current version is for the supplying team, the sellers to upload content and share it and convince the buyer. Mm -hmm. In the next iteration we're building over the next few months with the investment we raised, it's also enabled the sellers to upload and more, even more collaboration. So we're working that right now. But I think I say kind of conceptually, everywhere mm -hmm. we turn, people are pretty, pretty excited about what we do. Oh, yeah. I've seen things like this out in the world, but it is heavy procurement driven and it's antiquated and it's frustrating. And you have finance saying we're not going to work in that. We don't want to have to, you know, fit into their mold of how they want content delivered. So by, I think, 
allowing it to be a direct line buyer to seller and a lot more interaction. Definitely yeah, I think, think the other thing that, you know, when you, you've been in a lot of these processes yourself, right? On the selling side, you have, you know, the account manager, maybe multiple, you have pre-sales people, mm-hmm. you have project people, you have product experts, maybe someone from marketing, then some senior sales leader get involved. You know, you have a team of four, five, six, seven, eight people who oh, yeah. ideally want to be involved and, and at least informed. On the buyer side, you have head of application development, you have the head of security, you have, and all of a sudden on the buying side, you might have tens, maybe dozens of people. And right now, everything is flying back and forth over email and no one really has control, right? The salesperson is desperately trying to stay in control, but mm. it's kind of limited by the tools that they use. Yeah, oh, that's very cool. I think you're definitely onto something and a really cool part I love, which is what made me realize what you were up to and, and you know, the reason for reconnecting was this go-to-market strategy you have too, where you're doing your own form of a podcast, the 10 minutes of talk transactions. How has that come to shape and how is that helping you even, I'm sure, with the product development process? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the people who are participating, you know, we have side conversations around the product itself and how we move it forward. I thought we, you know, of course, we were doing it for promotional purposes, but the podcast itself is not about savvy at all. It's mm-hmm. about the fact that, you know, all these people that we speak to who are frustrated buyers or frustrated sellers that are just trying to do their jobs and have never been given the tools to do them, right? And by the way, CRM systems have a big big role to play, right? But they are essentially a backend database where you store your deal information. I'm yet to find a CRM system that helps the seller. The the sellers get asked to input a lot of data manually in most cases to help the company track, you know, your pipeline and your sales activities perhaps, but it doesn't help the seller win any business in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. So, so these frustrated sellers and buyers, you know, participate in our podcast and kind of share their stories. And, and also, I think the thing you talked about in the beginning around digital transformation, I think the change over the last 10, 15 years mm-hmm. has changed the sales process and the buying process as well, right? Mm-hmm. As things become much more front and center for a company to use IT in different ways, that puts different demands on both the buying team and how they interact with their internal stakeholders. Mm-hmm. The number of suppliers in the market today is, you know, a, t- a thousand X more than you had 15 years ago. It was much more simple, mm-hmm. a simpler um, kind of supplier space. Right now you have thousands and thousands of customers, uh, suppliers doing different things in different spaces, etc. So mm-hmm. to navigate that as well is hard. So, uh, so yeah, having a tool that can speed up you know, how you interact with suppliers, how you find information, how you decide whether or not this is the right supplier for you. You know, I say to people that whoever said it, Steve Jobs or someone, that if you have 10% market share uh, in any market, you are a gigantic company and probably worth multiple billions of dollars. But if you have 10% market share, that means nine times out of 10, you're losing, right? That means that nine times out of 10, buyers have said no to you uh, by, by definition. Um, so therefore that kind of process of saying no and qualifying out as a buyer and a seller is really important. And I think our tool will also help you kind of speedily get to the point of actually realizing this is not a good fit and it's important because you waste a lot of cycles. Oh yeah, absolutely. Is there a play too, because I see the CSPs creating their own marketplaces, you know, AWS marketplace, there's an Azure one, Google apps. Is there a play in part of that where you're able to integrate and, and have a piece of that puzzle that's part of Savvy as well? I mean, we, we are, I mean, a marketplace is a bit more of a click and buy, right? Yeah. Um, where Savvy leads up more to an enterprise sales process that takes a bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot more high touch on the buyer side and the seller side. There's a lot more evaluation going on and discussions. We probably mm-hmm. sign a custom, you know, negotiated framework agreement for licenses and services and mm-hmm. so on. So the marketplace side is interesting. I think that's a different buying motion. Yeah. Maybe after the savvy process is complete, it's then, mm-hmm. okay, now we're ready in marketplace and you feel really sound about that click to buy. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, you can actually do the negotiation around entering the marketplace through yeah. savvy and then, mm-hmm. you know, the actual deliverable is the access to the marketplace. Oh, that's good. I like it. I want to talk now a little bit about your 
passion and vision around mentorship. Cause it's something that I think is just super impressive about you. And I mean, I think I mentioned this when we first spoke that I thought it was really cool that you were over here doing your thing in Cal- cloud reach and you were happily mentoring Steven garden as he was taking his venture into Annika and like, you didn't even hold back. You were there to give and want him to be successful. And now that he's been successful, he still gives you a ton of credit as a mentor himself. And I'm sure that's a friendship that will last forever. Um, but how did that come about? And like, how do you see mentorship in this environment? Because obviously you don't find it at all as a threat but you see it as, Hey, there's a big market out there. I've only got 10%. Let's let others be successful and make their mark as well. Yeah. I mean, look, if if you're in like pharmaceutical or rocket science, whatever business you're in, right. (laughs) I'm sure there are industries where patents and, and, you know, ideas and and what you do is it has to be protected in a very, very careful way, right. Um, There are definitely those industries. I think most companies operate in and around things that in the end it's not the idea itself or you know how you think about the business that's going to differentiate is the execution of it right and yeah there there is by definition no market to be in unless you have competition and competitors that's just the nature of it Mm -hmm. um and i mean look let's be honest as well with we never really did much business in california steve's business were mainly california he branched out a bit later on so we never mm. quite competed head to head in 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 that sense, and mm. um, and for what it's worth, Stephen, I, I always found him a, a super super. He's a great guy through and through, um, yeah. genuine guy, and I like nice people and I like helping mm. nice people. So for me, that that you know when he when he said I'm going to set up a business in California, Pontus, I'm leaving you, I'm going to go over there. I said good luck, well done. I hope you succeed. Okay. Literally, no, 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 that that's. That's amazing, right? And yeah, may, may the best man win, in this case, man, may, may the best woman win, um, uh, et cetera, as well. So that's, I guess, that side of things. Um, and yeah, I mean, on, on the on the piece around mentorship, and what I, I, I obviously appreciate what you said and what Stephen might have said about me as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, o- over the years, I, I was asked a question on, quite a few occasions around having a mentor or who is your mentor, Pontus? Um, and, you know, I, in the beginning, I was like, oh, no, I don't have a mentor. It's going pretty well. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes when someone asks you a question enough times, you think, hang on a second, is there something wrong with me? Like, why, why do I not have a mentor? Maybe no one wants to mentor me, you know? Maybe it's me, uh, <laughs> et cetera. And, and I started kind of looking around and I thought about it a bit and I, researched a bit etc and every time I did I kind of came to the conclusion it's like I'm gonna have to spend a a lot of money and be a lot of time with this one person the world is big it's complicated you know and and this kind of topics ranges from you know how to deal with people and be a leader to products and technologies and tax and legal or I mean there's just so many topics right and, you know, apart from the Oracle at Delphi and ancient Greece, you know, not there, there is no such person out there that can cover everything that I'd like to know about stuff in, in, in the world. And that's just in the business world and the personal side, it's even more topics, right? Mm-hmm. So my next step was thinking, okay, so how did I get to this point without the mentor? What, what have I done, right? So all this kind of self-reflection. And I realized I'm quite a voracious reader. I, I read a lot. I, I wish I wish, listened to more podcasts and, and watch stuff on YouTube, but I, I just like reading. I really do. Everything, newspapers, blogs, um, books, loads of books, etc. And I realized that my mentorship comes from the amalgamation of everyone else's experiences that they have expressed through books, yeah. mainly books. Uh, books are my, my, my favorite uh, medium, basically. And therefore, when I looked at how I operate and, and the things that I do, I realized it's actually, I picked a bit of this book and a bit of that, and that's a good idea, and oof, I should avoid that, etc. Mm-hmm. And that's when I came up with that phrase around, you are your own best mentor, right? Because by, by not attaching yourself to one person, which I'm sure those people who have mentors don't do necessarily, but you put too much weight on that one relationship, I find. So in my case, for me, I found myself being my own mentor, the, the most efficient way of, of developing myself, basically. Yeah. 
take responsibility. That's good. Do you have like scheduled time where you're really intentional about that too? Of like, this is personal growth time for two hours on a Friday, or do you kind of, it sounds like have it a little more lifestyle integrated where it's every situation you're treating as a learning experience. Is that a fair evaluation? A hundred percent. Um, you know, I've been working with a company. It's been fascinating. And kind of coming back a bit on the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. I got a call about 18 months ago, 20 months ago, from someone uh, who's a CAO at a, at a large, very traditional British business called RS Components. Okay. And they basically have spare parts of factories, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of as old school as, as you get. They have other parts of that business today, but very successful, they're famous around the world, etc. And uh, this guy, Simon, we had a really nice chat. And I'm thinking, I don't know how you think I can help you because I have no idea about manufacturing. You are a three billion pound business. I don't know how you run three billion pound businesses. You know, you are truly big. And he said, well, Pontus, you know, we have this platform building, which uh, uh, is around um, essentially to help uh, predictive maintenance in factories. So they're building a software platform at AWS, a sticker device inside a factory, they connect a bunch of sensors to all the machines, and through looking at through vibration and water consumption and electricity, et cetera, the data gets pumped back into AWS and you can analyze it and see, ah, that machine is going to go bust in three weeks' time. So okay. rather than wait for that to happen, fix it now, right? So they were building that platform and they were having some internal challenges around really how to move it forward. And they said, we need to treat this as an internal startup. And you're a startup guy, Pontus. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, interesting. And I met the guy, Richard, who was running that whole project. And, and I'm still involved on a part, like a five, six hours a, a month or whatever it is, right? four or five hours a month. And I'm part of the steering group. And I've spoken to the CEO there a few times so who runs the whole of RS, et cetera. And it's been really fascinating because when you think about, when you think, a lot of pe people think digital transformation, you take like a Rockwell or like a big American company, it's been around for 150 years. Those are the companies we're trying to change by moving them to AWS or GCP or Azure and you know, re-platforming applications and do all that. All of a sudden, I had an actual opportunity to be part of it, or be a tiny part of it, through this project. And mm. you know, I, I think I've added some value to their everyday life and how, how to think about... Um, being a startup behaving, like how do startups behave and how should you think in this situation? How do you research customers? All this good stuff. But also I've learned a lot by just looking and observing and listening to how they make decisions and um, you know, what drives them, right? What questions do they ask? Because they have a very different reality, right? And they have this massive super tanker, three billion pounds steaming along. And these guys are almost pre-revenue sitting somewhere in this big mix. And uh, it's been really, really interesting. And, th and that's the kind of, when you say study time, carve out. It's like, no, get involved, get your hands dirty in lots of these little mini things. And, and whilst you give, you're also going to get quite a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the books and the reading, I just do it whenever I can. That's cool. Yeah, one of my favorite things is when I just jumped at opportunity, tried it, maybe failed, or even just had a, a positive, fun experience. And then it's six months, a year later, you look back and realize what you learned. Cause a lot of times you don't realize it in the moment at all, but you look yes. back, you're like, Oh, that's why I think this and why I think this is the right thing for the situation I'm in today. Those are cool. I love when it's like, wow, me taking that risk, me taking that trip, doing X, Y, Z, whatever project I totally learned from that. And I didn't even realize the value that that situation had at the time. And now looking back, it's like, wow, that was impactful. Yeah, well, 100%, right? I think where quite a lot of people might not spend enough time observing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this is kind of the point where you end up in this situation, you kind of go in, nose to the grindstone, do your job, et cetera, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to evolve and learn, you have to spend a lot of time just observing, thinking, observing, thinking. What's happening? Why is it happening? How are these dots connected? What can I take away from this? You know, is that a good or a bad thing? And this constant questioning and observing, uh, I think is important. And the other thing that 
whilst I'm doing a lot of talking here today because I'm on your podcast, you asked me to talk. You know, the, the, I always find the smartest people are those who ask the best questions. Yeah. No mm -hmm. doubt, hands down. So therefore observing, asking really good questions, mm -hmm. that's how you learn. That's how you mentor yourself and that's how you kind of move forward. It's good. So one final question then that this all leads me to, what is the guiding principle that you live by to be successful in business? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it kind of summarizes everything we've talked about in some ways, all the way back to the beginnings of CloudReach, et cetera. Yeah. The, the beginnings of CloudReach was really when I, I realized one day, about a year before, worked for Cisco and having this horrendous time negotiating maintenance agreement with companies who didn't want to pay maintenance for Cisco switches and the software that sits <laughs> on top of them and there's still no value in it, et cetera. Rather than just plowing on and kind of, corporate drone just keep going i started questioning like is this the best way why are everyone so angry about these things right they keep telling us they don't get value from it why are we not changing uh, etc and, and that led me eventually to discovering of the very 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 beginnings of cloud i mean aws was less than two years old when, when this moment happened right this was very very early on and, and so therefore, you know, arguably the reason why CloudWitch was started and I contacted James and got him on board, et cetera, is because I question, like, this is not right. All these endless upgrades and updates and non-value adding IT things that we do back in 2008, 9, 10, and even today, uh, led me down a different path, which led me to start a business that had mm -hmm. the most fun time of my entire career. I learned so much, you know, yes, there was a personal financial outcome at the end, but mm -hmm. the journey is a lot more fun than the destination. And, um, and that, that's kind of my guiding principle is that you have to constantly question, not constantly change. That's not the same thing. Just because you question doesn't mean you have to change. But I think the day you stop questioning why things are the way they are, you know, you hear people say, oh, that's industry standard. We've always done it this way. Why are you questioning us? I'm like, just because you always did it that way doesn't mean it's right. It might not even have been right at a time. It just became the way you do things, right? But it's actually a stupid way of doing it, things and we should question it and we should do something different. And that's how you evolve. That's how you discover new things, new ideas, new companies, new opportunities by questioning. So I think in my, if I had to pick one thing out of all, yeah, questioning, I think is the number one thing. It's awesome. And it served you very well, so. Thanks again for joining us on the show, Pontus. Huge fan. Love what you're doing and excited to see more of the impact you're going to make with Savvy. Fantastic, Rebecca. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Super interesting conversation. And uh, yeah, hopefully those who are listening found it interesting too. Yes. And we will link them to your 10 Minute to Talk Transactions podcast as well, as that's a very interesting show that I think folks would really get a kick out of listening to. So. Thanks again for participating. Excited to share more of your content and keep rocking at Savvy. We'll see you again soon. See you soon.